it's really um, a pleasure to uh, invite you to the Celebrating Our Associate Professors event. Um, the event really started in 2018 uh, as a way to uh, celebrate the success of our associate professors who've been through uh, a very rigorous uh, uh, you know, process uh, to get to the point of getting tenure and becoming associate professors. A very hard process where they had to uh, figure out how things work, uh, uh, you know, find and mentor great grad students, uh, figure out how to get funding, figure out how to, you know, serve so many things uh, that are required for successful uh, faculty and, uh, and uh, tenure and promotion. Uh, so it's really intended uh, in first place as an opportunity to congratulate all of you, but it has many other pieces to it. Uh, for example, uh, in the talks that our associate professors are going to present today, uh, they will, of course, be letting us know about what, what they're passionate about, uh, whether it's in research, teaching, uh, service, engagement, whatever. Uh, but they're also going to probably reflect on what key choices they made that enabled their success. And they'll also be talking a little bit about their future plans, their vision. Uh, and that together uh, provides many opportunities in this meeting. Uh, certainly for those who have uh, been advocates and champions uh, for these faculty, it's a great chance for us to celebrate. Uh, but this is also an opportunity for all the uh, PhD students in the audience, uh, postdocs in the audience to see uh, you know, the tangibles and intangibles that go towards success and getting tenure uh, so that you might be successful in the future as well. And thirdly, it's a really important opportunity for new collaborations. As faculty colleagues join this meeting and listen to what you're doing and how your interests have evolved, uh, this will lead and spark and lead to new connections, new collaborations into the future. Uh, so with that said, uh, I would like to invite Professor Amy Reedman to introduce our first speaker. Uh, Amy is a professor of electrical and computer engineering, and she also serves in the capacity of the associate head for faculty mentoring uh, and recognition. Over to you, Amy. Thanks, Arvind. Um, yeah, so it's my delight to be able to introduce today um, our one of our new associate professors, Stanley Chan. Stanley got his PhD in electrical engineering from UCSD, and then got had a postdoc in both electrical engineering and statistics at Harvard. Um, these happened up until 2014. And in 2014, he was hired here at Purdue in the integrated imaging cluster. And he has a joint appointment currently between ECE and statistics. And in terms of his research, he started out looking at image restoration and then looked a little bit more deeply into signal processing and graph theory. And now here at Purdue, he's been looking at computational photography particular research in single photon imaging and um, Im imaging through turbulence. Um, I see that my internet connection is unstable, so hopefully you're hearing me okay. Um, he has received a best paper award at our flagship conference on image processing, the IEEE International Conference on Image Processing in 2016. He um, has developed several graduate and undergraduate level data science courses here at Purdue. He's been a strong leader in that educational development of data science at Purdue. And um, he's received many teaching awards, including the College of Engineering's Exceptional Early Career Teaching Award, the Ruth and Joel Spira Outstanding Teaching Award, Purdue Teaching for Tomorrow Fellow. And I'm really excited to have him. I really enjoy having him as a member of my technical community here at Purdue. And I'm delighted to hear what he has to say for us today now. Thanks. Thank you, Amy. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, it is my great pleasure to be here to share with you uh, some of the research uh, that I have been doing over the past couple of years, as well as uh, teaching experience. Uh, the research I do is computational photography. Um, it is at the intersection of three subjects, physical world, sensors, and algorithms. Uh, the traditional way of thinking about these three is that you go out to the field and collect some data, and then you process the data afterwards. In computational photography, the spirit is that we are going to put all these three together. We are going to rethink about the role of the sensor. How do we put algorithms on the sensor? And how do we put the physical models into the algorithm so that we can do a better imaging uh, task? 
So in the following couple of slides, I'm gonna show you uh, some research projects, uh, specifically the two projects um, that I've been doing for the past couple of years. And then I will talk about some teaching uh, experience. Okay, so let's talk about the first project that I'm really, really happy about. It is uh, uh, learning to enable photon limited imaging with a subtitle of possibly uh, the next generation camera of the CCD and CMOS. Um, cameras have evolved a lot over the past 100 years, and we are enjoying uh, cameras a lot today. But one problem that is there since the beginning of the camera, which is the low light problem. Um, this is a real image um, my student uh, captured in our uh, optical room using a CMOS camera. Uh, in a very low light condition. And you can see that it is extremely noisy. Um, and you may attribute this problem to the imperfectness of the sensor. Uh, however, for people who have been working on this problem for a long time, you realize that this is really not the problem of the uh, sensor. Yes, there is some problem with the sensor, but if you have the ideal sensor, meaning that um, the sensor is perfect, uh, it doesn't have any defect, has zero read noise, uh, this is the image that you would get from the ideal sensor. And this is not a surprise because uh, photons comes as a Poisson process and, it, uh, and that is uh, random by nature. Um, and if you compare this image to what we have uh, used to see in the image processing literature, uh, the comparison is just huge. Uh, we, we, we realize that. Now you ask, what, what can we do as engineers um, to do a better job in terms of imaging in the, this low light condition? Uh, there are two things we need to think about. One is, can we build a, a new type of sensor, uh, which I will talk about briefly, the quantum image sensor. It's a new type of image sensor that, can, that will be a little bit closer to the ideal sensor. And the second question would be, uh, suppose now you have a much better sensor, can you do some new um, uh, imaging tasks that, that was not able to achieve in the past? Um, so over the past couple of years, um, I spent a lot of time working on a new type of image sensor uh, called a quantum image sensor. This is a collaboration with uh, colleagues at Dartmouth College and also a company, uh, GigaJot Technology. Um, the new sensor operates in a very special way. Uh, as it sees a, a photon that comes to the sensor, it doesn't acquire the voltage as uh, we used to see. Uh, instead, it acquires binary bit patterns. So for every pixel, you either see a yes, there is a photon, or no, there's no photon. Each um, pixel is, um, it, it is done by a single photon detector. And so uh, you can theoretically prove that with this new type of sensor, the signal to noise ratio can be improved. The dynamic range can be improved. But then the, the typical challenge here would be how do you reconstruct an image from these kinds of measurements? Uh, so over the past couple of years, we do uh, quite a few things, uh, including developing algorithms, uh, theory, um, and, and so on. So there are lots of things that we have been able to accomplish. And now the sensor is becoming uh, ready um, to, to use. Um, <clears throat> Here is a snapshot of the things that we were able to accomplish. Um, the left-hand side is a pattern recognition system at extremely low light condition, where we are able to, uh, to see an image at 0.25 photons per electron uh, per, per, per pixel, and that is extremely dark. And we can see that we are able to predict the correct class. The images on the right is a reconstruction that we are able to uh, accomplish that the fan is rotating, is extremely dark, and the conventional approach will either mess up the motion or it cannot denoise. And with our new approach, we are able to uh, do a much better denoising and motion handle. All right, so now let me switch gear to talk about another major project that I've been working on. And this is uh, the project of uh, learning to see through atmospheric turbulence. The images here should not be a stranger to many of you. If you uh, have a hot day and you go out and you look at images, these will be the typical turbulent distorted images that you will see. Uh, to our sponsors uh, in DOD and also um, um, other folks, um, this problem is an extremely valuable problem to them and people have been working on this problem for a long time. So, 
um, if you present this problem to a graduate student uh, nowadays, the typical response would be, uh, let's say, let's just uh, grab a lot of data and train a network and get, and get whatever we get. And I've been joking with my graduate students that if you talk to the network for long enough, uh, it will confess, it will give you something. Uh, but for this turbulent problem, uh, this kind of philosophy doesn't work. The reason is that you don't have ground truth. Um, the turbulence level is unknown, the weather condition is unknown, and you need just a lot of these data to train the network. So we go back and ask, what else can we do in this problem? Uh, can we do something at the, at the, at the root uh, to solve this problem? So I spent a couple of years, uh, almost three years, with no publication in this, uh, this subject. Um, but we ran through the literature from the 1940s to the 80s, and from the 80s to the uh, year 2000, um, we went through all this literature, and we, our goal is really to open up the black box of turbulence physics. Uh, so last year, we finally, uh, we are able to uh, develop our first um, simulator, which is the collapsed phase over aperture simulator that can mimic that, uh, that extremely complicated um, wave propagation uh, process. Um, um, then earlier this year, uh, we invented a second simulator This is called a phase-to-space transform. Um, and this simulator can speed up by a thousand times compared to this uh, one of the state-of-the-art simulator. So you ask, so what, right? So what, um, uh, and here's the deal. If you have a much faster simulator, you can actually generate a lot of images. Uh, you can generate thousands to tens of thousands of images in a short period of time. And therefore, you can use them to synthesize training data and train the network. So here is an example using the synthetic data that we're able to, gen uh, to generate, and you can get a much better reconstruction compared to the past. Uh, during this process, I'm also very happy uh, that we are able to build some uh, equipment uh, setups uh, in, in, in Purdue to uh, to get the uh, these uh, measurements. Uh, these are the real measurements. I'm very happy to do this one-stop shop research in, in this problem. Okay, so uh, so let me finish up my talk by sharing some um, experience in teaching. I mainly teach machine learning in artificial intelligence at Purdue. And I would say that this is a major initiative at Purdue and I'm very happy to uh, contribute a little bit to this giant effort. Uh, so I joined in 2014. Uh, and the first day I came to Purdue, I started to teach a 300 level course in probability uh, and I've been teaching it every year. Um, then in 2015, I created a 600 level course on sparse modeling. Um, and that is a PhD level course. 2018, I created the machine learning. Uh, we had about 300 students in the beginning, and now it becomes more stable. We have 100 students across the entire college taking my course. Uh, the same year, I created uh, a 200 level course with Muley Kukarni. Uh, it now becomes uh, the Python for data science. Uh, I also need to acknowledge a lot of faculty, uh, junior faculty who contributed to develop this course. Uh, it's a really, really great course now. Um, I also created the machine learning reading group. This is the machine learning reading group at uh, the uh, College of Engineering. Uh, we run weekly seminar. Um, and earlier this year, I created the high school machine learning outreach program that we are reaching to 40 kids uh, per, per course. Um, and so uh, I can see that some gaps, but I, um, I, I can see that the this entire pipeline from high school all the way to teach level, I'm pretty pleased uh, to see this uh, complete uh, pipeline um, during the past couple of years. And uh, if we want to teach data science, we need to have a Purdue textbook. And this is one of the efforts that I've been doing. Uh, I've been writing this book, uh, Intro to Probability for Data Science, uh, with the goal really to reduce the textbook price um, to help uh, students and families. Uh, so it will be free PDF, and you will be sold at a discounted co copy um, price. And uh, there are some uh, interesting elements of this book, uh, including uh, I put a lot of time thinking about how to write it clearly and explain the typical concepts to students. Uh, if you're interested, uh, you can go to my website, and it's available for preview. If you see any box, let me know. See any typos, let me know. I'm still revising the book. With that, I will say thank you. I want to give special thanks to all my students. They do the, all the hard work. I want to thank my colleagues, uh, also my collaborators, as well as the funding agencies.
Thank you very much. Thanks, Stanley. So um, at this stage, we can open the floor to questions. If anybody has any questions or comments. I have one. Have you given any thought to um, what what was most influential in steering you in the direction that you chose with respect to how you approach tenure and achieving tenure and where you put your energy as you did so? Sure. What was um, helpful at Purdue? This is an excellent question. Um, so I guess everyone has a choice. Um, we have a lot of freedom. We can choose whatever we want to do and everyone's career's success definition is different. Um, I can only speak for myself. I think that um, um, to me, I want to be a scholar. I just want to be a scholar. I don't want to be a manager. I don't want to run a 30 people lab. Uh, that's just not me. Um, uh, and to become a scholar, I, I need to focus on a problem that really, that really made, made me feel excited. And over the past couple of years is these two problems. And certainly I have a much bigger problem in my mind uh, that I need some time to formulate. Um, but the, the thing that's been driving me most is uh, the research interest. Um, focus on the thing that you want to do and try to uh, get help from the people that, uh, that, can, uh, that can discuss with you, brainstorm with you, and work out, uh, do hard work, and try not to exploit, uh, try not to exploit the game. Uh, just do what you're supposed to do. Uh, I think this is the, um, the principle that I'm holding. And I think it, it has been okay with me. Um, I don't know how it would affect other people. I, uh, it's just me. Okay, thanks. Um, Phil, you have a question? Yeah, hi, Stanley. That was really um, interesting. Thanks a lot. Um, I just had a question about teaching. Um, as a new professor, like seeing that you built three, I think three new courses um, or four, five, I don't know, like a lot. It seems like I've just finished building my first course and it was a lot of work. Um, do you have any advice? Like, was this too much? Was this great? Like, I was just wondering if you could share some insight on that. Sure. Um, I, if I were to go back in time, I think I would just create one. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I think it's better to focus on one thing and make it good rather than spreading it to the end. Although I do, I do enjoy teaching. This is, this is why I'm here. Um, and I, I like interacting with students. Uh, however, if I can do it all over, I would say that I would just create my machine learning course uh, to make it the best machine learning course. Um, yeah, I, 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 but I think again, everyone has a different career goal. And so I think it, it, it is all open to, to, to faculty's choice. Awesome. We have, That's what I was wondering, thanks. We have a question in the chat from AJ. He says, as a former student of your 595 machine learning class, I really enjoyed it. How was your experience teaching students from many different departments? Uh, VJ, you're asking an excellent question. It's tough. Um, it's about uh, understanding their background. I think, I think most of the time, um, struggle of faculty is to, um, to sort of not pay attention to the prerequisites. Um, not, not the prerequisites that we put on the book, but the, the, different, the different background that people have. Um, they really, so someone come from a Purdue undergraduate student is of course it's different from someone coming from the international school. Um, so we, we gotta understand that. And we want to calibrate um, the students on the first day. Uh, what is my expectation? And whether you have the necessary background, if not, here are the resources that I'm willing to help you. 
uh, if you need more time, don't worry. I'm here to help you. Don't worry, take your time to learn. Uh, if you feel that you want to learn it in a later semester, don't worry, take it in a later semester. If you feel that you're ready, you're welcome to the class. I will do all my best to, to help you to learn. Uh, you do your part and I do my part and let's work together to, to make this learning experience wonderful. Right? I think this is how I can, I can help the variety of students. Thanks. Right, anyone have any other questions for Stanley? Hearing none, um, I'd like to thank Stanley very much. I wish him a lot of success in his future, um, in his future as an associate professor here at Purdue. And um, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, I just wanted to congratulate Stanley also on his success and uh, you know the amazing work he does. I think what stands out is besides he, he spoke about his research, but. Uh, He's also such a committed and successful uh, teacher and educator. Um, uh, it's, it's great to have you as a colleague, Stanley. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Arlen. Yeah.